Hey guys, this video is brought to you by my Patreon. More about that at the end of the video. Hey guys, welcome to part two on my Iron Man video. Um, I'll give you just a brief exam uh, explanation of what I've been doing here. Um, my goal is to become Iron Man. My ultimate goal is to break the speed of sound. Uh, I've been working on manufacturing the Mark I here for about a year. Um, I worked on design of it for about two years before that, and all together I've been trying to become Iron Man for about five years, and we're getting pretty close right now. So I'm going to kind of explain all this to you, and then uh, we're going to put it on and do some testing. Um, we also tested this morning some uh, firearms resistance to this, so I'll put some descriptions down below if you don't want to watch the entire video and you just want to skip the exciting parts, but I hope you stick around because I think it's the description of how I was able to pull off this kind of insane thing is uh, pretty interesting. So let's get into it. So the first thing I want to go through is the functionality. Um, and the theory for how this thing works is I call it the aligned axes of rotation. So I studied um, sports medicine in college and uh, I figured out pretty effectively how the human body moves. And for example, in your shoulder, you have one, two, and three axes of rotation, and then you have another two from the shoulder girdle, forward and backwards, and so all in all, to move your shoulder, you have five axes. And the suit, <laughs> it was a bad example because I don't have any arms on this yet, this is part two, and part three will be the arms. The part one was the, the lower body. This, everything up here, everything above the pelvis is new. So the lumbar, the torso, the head, the neck, that's all new. But that's the theory for how this thing moves together. So there's, an angle, there's a joint here on the knee, and then there's another joint down here on the knee. Um, so there's three different types of joints. Um, so the, f the first one I'm gonna show you is called a ring joint. And so this right here is rotating in and out. And this is one of the two um, axes I was talking about on the knee. Um, so this is a ring joint. And if you bring the camera just a little bit closer and you kind of point inside, um, you'll see that this ring actually goes all the way around and the joint goes all the way around here. Um, okay, that's, that should be good right there. Um, and then uh, if you come, maybe over here a little bit can we do that um and i'll show you this hinge joint right here so this is a joint that acts like a hinge um so this comes up and down so here is the knee there um and these are the two two at two degrees of freedom of the knee um and so hinge joint ring joint and then the final type of joint we have um is going to be this type of joint right down here and this is called a lobed joint and this we can't get a a the joint completely center on the joint because it would go through your body. So we have to take the the axes is inside the foot, so we have to bring it up here, and that allows it to move like this. So this is called a lobe joint, and those are the three types of um, joints that are on the suit. Okay, so now I want to talk about some of the components and main parts of the suit. Um, the 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 lower body uh, was so there's. There's all these struts that were welded together, and then there was covering that was put on top. The lower body was welded on. You see these welds down in here. Um, I decided to stop doing that for a number of reasons, um, mostly because it was time commitment and uh, also causing the material to warp. So I actually switched to a riveted design, and you can see those nicely in here. This is a much thinner gauge metal, um, and then it was riveted on. and. I really like this design. I think it's a lot better. Um, there's a few places where I couldn't get rivets, and I used small screws. But that is a, a new part of the design of this. Another new thing, um, and I'm going to have you bring the camera back over here again, are these socks. These socks right here and here. Um, and then if you look inside here, I like the way they're attached. This is a, uh, it's attached in here and this is a piece of elastic. And this just holds this in here and it's designed to both allow me to get my foot into the, the suit, but also to add padding because the suit is fairly uncomfortable to wear. Eyes, polycarbonate, very cool. Um, this is uh, what glasses are made out of. Um, it's also what safety glasses are made out of. If we had layered a piece of glass on top of this and then polycarbonate, glass polycarbonate, that's how they make um, bulletproof glass, uh, like banks and stuff, cars, whatever. Um, I do want to do that eventually on uh, a later version of the suit. I want to have bulletproof um, eyes. And then uh, the other thing I want to, you to look at here, um, you may want to get just a little bit closer here, uh, is these mesh mouthpieces. This is designed just to add a little bit of breathability, but also I wanted the aesthetic of this to be an old school Iron Man look. So um, it's got the, the strong eyes and then this right here. So these are actually through holes that allow a little bit of breath to come through, which is kind of cool. 
Um, the helmet. The helmet is pretty cool. This is gonna be the first time you guys get to see this, and I think it's pretty neat. There are gas springs inside of here, and um, there are these struts that run through here that the gas gas spring is pushing on, and then the uh, latches here were handmade. Um, they're a little bit finicky. They don't hold this the thing down completely well, but um, ended up making these mostly by hand, especially the latch, and then, and then also parts of it were machined as well. But then it closes down, just like that, and then. Uh, pops back open. Um, like I said, it's a little bit janky and it tends to pop open. Um, I may fix that uh, by the time I completely finish the suit, but that's about where it is right now. Um, okay, so this morning, as I mentioned earlier, I did some ballistics testing on this because I was curious if um, this thickness of aluminum, this 6061 aluminum, would be able to stop a bullet and what caliber of bullet it would stop or fail at. Um, so I'm gonna let Dylan from like three hours ago, go ahead and explain that and then we'll come back here. What is going on everybody? I am out here and, uh, well I'm out here somewhere and I'm gonna do some shooting and do some testing on the ballistic capability of my suit. Now I'm not gonna shoot my suit because it took way too much time to uh, build it, but I have some metal that I cut it from and we're gonna figure out what it can stop. I have two plates next to each other because that's how a lot of the suit is. There's two plates um, on top of each other and um, then I also have some of my really thin gauge stuff too. We're going to be shooting a uh, 22 um, long rifle out of a pistol. Um, we're going to shoot it with a 12 gauge buckshot. Uh, we're going to shoot it with a 9 millimeter um, uh, hollow point. It's like a Gucci self defense round too, so we'll see what that does. And then we're going to shoot it with a 223 and 556 five, green tip, which is like a uh, kind of armor piercing round a little bit. It was They were trying to make it illegal in the United States. Uh, it's not like an incendiary round or anything. Um, I'm not going to show the weapons a lot because YouTube is kind of weird about guns, but um, I'm going to run through these really quick and I'll show you the interesting things as we go. So let's do it. Okay, so thin gauge material, it's a truck going by, hold on. Thin gauge material will not stop 22, so we're not even gonna bother shooting that again. We might shoot it with 12 gauge. All right, so that is more than capable of stopping a, uh, the one plate is more than capable of stopping a 22 long rifle, but that's weak. <laughs> that's a very uh, not impressive round. So we are going to move on to something far more real. But before we get far more real, we are going to, uh, um, we're gonna do a shotgun. So this is a 12 gauge shotgun, which is a big-ish shotgun. So definitely enough to bend the metal. Um, would not feel good to get hit by this if you're wearing the suit. And uh, probably would cause a deflection in the suit that would not allow you to move around, but uh, would definitely survive. Of course, it's a shotgun, so it may go through some spots and hit me in another place. But. Okay, thin gauge stuff, definitely not stopping a shotgun, 12 gauge. We're done with that, we're not shooting that anymore. Okay, we're gonna be moving up to nine millimeter now. Ah, oh, I missed. <laughs> 
All right, I shot the one I wasn't aiming at, but here's the nine millimeter. And remember, this is a uh, this is a round designed to open up because it's, it's designed for uh, hitting a human. It's a self-defense round. So you know, there's a chance that a uh, a full metal jacket may have a little bit more penetration, but we're not going to worry about it a whole lot because um, I didn't bring anything else. So we're going to move up to the the real gun and uh, oh, we need this. Um, we're going to move up to the real gun. We're going to start, like I said, we're going to start with two, two, three, and then we're going to switch to green tip, which is has a higher penetration. It's got a steel core. Okay, so the first round I missed, <laughs> apparently I'm a little flinchy today, but um, it went right through here. Uh, I admit, I just went through one, and then this is the second shot. This hole, this hole right here, is the uh, second shot, and that went straight through both. So, um, is this thing bullet resistant? Uh, yeah, yeah it is. I don't even think there's a reason to shoot it with green tip. Obviously it's gonna go through. Maybe I'll do it for fun at the end. Kind of sounds fun. But um, obviously this is bullet resistant. Uh, it would stop a nine millimeter. Um, but it is not going to stop a rifle round, uh, which <laughs> is a thing, you know, if you're watching YouTube videos, you can shoot something with something, but you know, if you're talking about one of the most common rounds on planet earth, especially in America is the 5.56, the nine millimeter is the most, this, this pistol in my, in my pants right now is the, the most popular gun in the United States. Um, so if you get shot by that, it's what most police officers carry. Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna slow some stuff down. In fact, it's probably gonna stop it. Um, on the chest and stuff, but uh, as far as getting in a, a rifle fight for whatever reason, um, that's not going to stop anything. So it's just this is just a test to, to demonstrate that uh, um, things aren't always bulletproof, even though they're bullet resistant. So um, yeah, eventually I'm going to be using titanium, and that should actually be able to stop a rifle round. Let's shoot this thing one more time with green tip and see what it does. All right, uh, I shot it twice because um, the first time went right on top of the same one. I just wanted a good comparison. Here's the other one. Now you'll see that this is the second time, uh, going to the second layer, and it opens up a lot more. My camera died, but um, obviously 6061 aluminum is uh, not gonna stop a 5.56 and is not gonna be bullet resistant to a uh, rifle round. So um, yeah, there you go. Thank you for watching this episode, of, this episode of Demolition Ranch, and I'll see you next time. See how many people got that, bye guys. <laughs> And then one thing I uh, forgot to mention when actually doing the, uh, the, the bullet testing that I just thought was kind of cool and wanted to share with you is that when the round went through the first um, sheet of aluminum, it kind of opened up and almost like caused the, uh, the aluminum to melt on the other side. And I just found that interesting and wanted to share it with you guys. But that's all I have to say about that. Okay. So now we're going to talk about one of my favorite parts, which is manufacturing. Um, I, I love building stuff. I built my own CNC machine. If you want to pan over to that really quick and show them my CNC machine that I built by hand. Um, yeah, this is, this is the machine that a lot of this was built on. Um, you can go ahead and come back to me though, because we're going to have a lot of B-roll in there. Um, but the way this was done, I'm going to go through the principles for how all of this was manufactured. And uh, 
So it started off coming out of full sheets and then I essentially cut it out in like a two dimensional pattern. Um, this would have been much better to do with like a laser cutter or a water jet, uh, something like that, but I didn't have access to that. So I actually did it on standoffs on my mill. Um, not a great way to machine, lots of chatter, uh, heat goes into the part. Not the best way to do it, but it was doable and it did work. And so that is how like that piece right here got me machined. All this got machined that way. Um, and then there are some components that were not done that way. And a great example of that would be the, the cap on this lobe joint that I was talking about earlier. This part was machined um, on, a, on a vise inside of a CNC. So if you're familiar with CNC machining, this is a more traditional type of machining um, that you would be familiar with. And then there was a fixture to hold it for OP2. Um, and so that's how those components were done. And then um, these, these caps right here, or if you look at maybe some of these down in here, these parts right here were done on the lathe. Um, so these were done um, on a manual lathe and were, uh, so the, the, the work is spinning and not the tool. Um, and then they were, the holes were, they were then chucked into a vise on the um, mill and then that's how the holes were put in there. So then once I had all the two dimensional geometry um, cut out, I then TIG welded it together. Uh, this is my really dusty TIG welder right over here if you want to pan right over there. Um, Pan right over there, please. There we go. This is my TIG welder. This is how I uh, um, welded all that together. And uh, I'll try to put some B-roll over all this as well. Um, but this was the machine that I used to TIG weld this all together. Um, TIG welding aluminum is, is pretty challenging, but I got a master class in it from making this thing. Um, one of the other manufacturing techniques I used is uh, cold forging. Um, so most of these panels, well, all these panels were um, hammered out. They were hammered, hammered out on a, um, uh, a vise, um, I'm sorry, an anvil, and then um, they were riveted on, as I mentioned earlier. So that's how these parts were made. Um, and then the last manufacturing technique I used was, of course, sewing, and that's how I put um, the socks together. And eventually, I would like to make a Kevlar base layer, an aluminized Kevlar base layer for this um, to make the entire thing fire resistant, because I want to build flamethrowers for this guy. Um, but we'll see if I get to that. So now I'm going to talk about kind of the, that was the manufacturing technique, so I'm going to talk about the uh, process for how I got this guy together. So once it came, the two dimensional parts came off the machine, everything had to be deburred, um, which was a lot of work, but I uh, got that done. Um, then uh, none of the threads were tapped, so all the holes had to be enlarged, and then um, thread tapped, which was also a lot of work, because all those were done by hand. I didn't have a machine to do those. Then it was welded, as I mentioned. And then um, I did a number of test fits uh, multiple times, um, getting in and out of the suit, just making sure it fits together and would move without me in the suit. And then after all that was done, I broke down the entire suit, um, cleaned it all off, lubed it up, put it back together with thread lock. Um, and that's where it is right now. Oh, one part that I forgot to mention. Um, is the, another manufacturing technique that's been used in this is 3D printing. Um, all of these supports in here that are designed to kind of touch my bones and keep give me a little bit of padding, although not much because they're pretty rigid, uh, from the metal and allow me to move the suit um, were done on a 3D printer, an FDM 3D printer um, for the most part. I want to mention that uh, one of the things I was going to try to do in the finale of this video that I'm not going to be able to do is uh, I was going to try to balance two people on my head because I thought it would be a great demonstration of the strength of this suit. Now, unfortunately, we weren't able to do that because um, the huge moment arms in this and the fact that um, aluminum is very much not stiff means this thing acted like a giant spring. It would, it, the, the simulations I ran on this says this thing should be able to hold about 800 pounds on top of the head before it starts to fail, but um, it shrinks like three or four inches and the load transferred to my head and it didn't work. But it would have worked if, <laughs> if it wasn't so squishy. Now I'm going to make the Mark II most likely out of carbon fiber and that is a much stiffer material, a very stiff material, and um, that may actually be able to do it. But I just kind of wanted to mention that so you guys know how insanely strong this thing is because it is very, very strong. And uh, that is all the talking I'm going to do. Now we're going to get me into the suit and then uh, we're going to do a little bit of testing on this. Um, first I'm going to show you the range of motion and then we're going to do a little testing. So. Let's get after that. There's two other things I wanted to mention. Um, one is this Franken chair, which I just kind of brought together. I'm not sure it's the best way to do this. Um, I may end up changing it. I will definitely do something better on the Mark II. 
And then the other thing I wanted to mention is you, you'll notice I've changed clothes. That's because this thing is incredibly greasy. Um, that is the medium that this thing is running on. Eventually, on Mark II or Mark III, I want to have a way to have all of these bearing surfaces sealed so that I don't get covered in grease while doing this. And those are just two other things I wanted to mention before we get in the suit. Okay, as you can see, the suit is sagging down a little bit, and uh, that's actually because I removed a 3D printed component that's actually keeping it higher on my uh, head, and uh, I just forgot to put it back in. I was doing some testing, but um, you can see the suit works pretty good. Um, I'm going to go through and talk about the range of motion, but first I want to talk about something I actually forgot to mention, which is the fact that the suit um, has two layers. So here you can see in the, uh, the torso that there's a superficial and a deep layer. And the reason for that is I've developed the uh, highest strength to weight ratio hydraulic actuators on planet Earth. They're way stronger than typical actuators and they would shear apart materials if it's just supported on one side. Now, to counter that, I decided to make a double-sided suit. But then I realized that is not entirely true, it's not entirely necessary. It's only necessary in the arms and the legs. It's not necessarily in the torso because it's actually surrounded all the way and it's actually very strong. So future version of this suit will not have two layers like this. It will be much more simple. But the fact that I can get this as complicated and overly complicated as it is to move around um, is pretty impressive and I think shows my, my concepts of how this moves to be very valid. So I'm gonna go through and talk about the ranges of motion of this suit. So to start with, we have side to side here um, and that is actually moving in the back if I turn around you'll be able to see here in the center there's a joint um, right here right here um, that allows this to go side to side there is forward and backward there's two sets of joints there's one at the head and one at the torso allowing it to go forward and backwards and then this one's a little bit sticky but I can also turn my head and look this way and this way as well there it is just like that so um, similar range of motion is going to be occurring down at the lumbar. Um, so the first one is going to be the sagittal movement, which is forward and backwards. And um, that's coming from here. And then there's also another one down here. And that's forward and backwards. And then there's a series of four joints. And one thing you should keep in mind is that every single one of these joints has multiple joints aligned to it. Um, but I have side to side like this. And this is probably the, one of the highest ranges of motion. Here, back up just a little. And then uh, this way and this way. Um, is the last range of motion. This is um, going to the transverse plane of the body right here. So those are three ranges of the motion for the lumbar. Now we're going to go on. I'm going to go ahead and I've done a video on the legs. I'm going to go ahead and just show you all that as well. Uh, so the first one coming off the pelvis is allowing the legs to come in and out like this. And then there's a joint here that allows sagittal motion of the leg to come up like that. Um, you're obviously seeing the knee bend as well. Um, which I showed you earlier, but then we have internal and external rotation of the hip right here. So those are the three motions of the hip. And then again, there's the knee I just talked about. And then lastly, this one is one of the stickier ones on the suit, but you have internal and external of the knee as well right there. And then there are two ranges of motion on the ankle. There is this motion right here, um, which would be in the frontal plane like this. And then there would be the sagittal plane which would allow me to go down and do something like that. And then there's also a toe joint that allows the toes to lift up and down. And you can kind of see those there. Okay, so those are all the ranges of motion. So I want to do a little bit of testing. Um, obviously I did some testing, uh, ballistic testing on the metal, but we're gonna do just a little bit of testing. Um, let me get my dad here and he's gonna kick me and kind of beat me up a little bit. And what's interesting about the suit is because it's all jointed, you really don't feel it. You get hit and the load transfers and moves the suit and very little of the energy is actually transferred to me. So that's what we're gonna do next. All right, so we're gonna do some testing. 
That's gonna kick me in the groin. Go ahead. There you go. Doing it right down in the groin though. Harder. Harder, come on. Okay, there you go, that was a good kick. Um, can you do one more right at the lumbar? Yeah, there it is. Good, take this. Do that one again, I kinda missed that last shot. Wizard. Oh, it's hurting my foot. It's, he's got a hurt foot. It's okay, here, take this. Um, hit me in the leg. Okay, but now hit me like you mean it. There you go. I literally don't feel any of that, that one in particular. Hit me again, on this side. Okay, but hit hard. Cool, now let's do one of those in the chest. So don't hit my arms, but hit me right, right here in the chest. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's do this way a little bit so you get a shot. There we go. One more. Hit a little harder. Come on, hit a little harder. One more time, a little harder. That time I could start to feel it transfer into my chest a little bit. If he was swinging as hard as he could, it might hurt, but it's not bad. Grab a handful of nails. Grab a fistful of them. Should throw them at my face when I close the visor as hard as you can. Okay, go. Oh, it opened up, so that's not <laughs> great. But obviously, um, nails aren't going to go through polycarbonate. Um, grab that stick. Hit me inside. Hit me inside the head. Not too hard to start with. Yeah. So that hurts a little bit more. I mean, it didn't hurt. But um, with that one, this joint is not locked out. So if this thing was actuated, you could lock the head down. You could literally get this to where you couldn't feel any of the energy going into your body in theory. So um, I think that's all I have for you guys. So we're at the end. We've done all the testing. This is um, everything I have to show you guys. Uh, if you're new to the channel, please hit subscribe. Um, and my channel is not that well known and I'm doing some pretty cool stuff. So I don't have any sponsors, but I'm going to ask you to do something. If you could ask or you could show a friend what I am doing and let them decide if they want to subscribe to my channel. That'd be great. So that's my request to you is just show this to someone who would find it fascinating. And uh, thank you for watching till the very end. You guys have a great day. What's going on guys? Um, as I said at the beginning of this video, this, is, this video is brought to you by my Patreon. Um, a bunch of people have been telling me to get a Patreon for a long time because they want to support me. And for starters, I was just so busy building the suit. I know that's not a good excuse that I haven't done it. Uh, and I just didn't have that many followers. And then uh, then I went to Texas and uh, I met Elon Musk. Yeah, it's uh, hydraulic, so it's got a bladder in here. And so it's a McKibben artificial muscle. Have you ever heard of that? Um, and that dude is so famous that if you stand next to him, there's so many eyeballs on him that some of those eyeballs will go to you. Um, so I got a lot of bunch of followers from going down there. And uh, you know, it was just time. You know, if you uh, really want to support me and what I'm doing, um, you should be able to do that, and uh, I need I need the help. So um, yeah, that's what this is. This is what I'm trying to tell you is now I have a Patreon. The link is going to be down below. Um, you know, I worked for about 200 hours, uh, 200 hours, 100 hours a week building the arm. There's a little sneak peek for you guys. I'm not going to show you anymore. Sorry, uh, it broke off on coming back from Texas. <laughs> Got to fix the 3D printed part, but. Uh, 100, 105 hours a week, literally, to build that thing. Exhausting. I put a lot of work into this, um, and I'm I am so poor. It's ridiculous. Uh, hopefully, that'll change soon, but uh, it's not changed yet. So, if you would like to support me, um, go to the link below. It would mean a lot to me. Uh, you know, I just kind of ask that, like, you know, give me the amount that you that you feel like you're receiving in value from this. You know, whatever it's worth to you. If you're rich and you want to give me a bunch of money, awesome. If you're poor and you want to give me a buck, also awesome. <laughs> I would really appreciate it and uh, I love you guys. Thank you for watching till the end. Um, flamethrowers and arms coming soon and I got some other fun things coming as well. Bye guys.